It's hard to believe, but just 500 years ago, this picturesque and vacant pasture near Kelso on the Scottish borders was the site of one of the wealthiest cities in Scotland. Founded by a king, a hub of international trade and holding a key strategic position, Roxburgh, along with Berwick, Stirling and Edinburgh, was one of the four great urban centres of medieval Scotland. But whereas the other three are still thriving towns, ancient Roxburgh simply vanished. All that's left of this once great borough are the few decaying remains of its castle. So where is it? And why isn't this field a buzzing metropolis like Edinburgh? The answer is, we simply don't know. There are no contemporary maps, documents are scarce, and amazingly, no archaeologists have been allowed to dig here until now. So, a whole city, virgin archaeology, three days, can we do it? And the clue. But whatever happens, it's going to stretch us to the limit. This is probably the biggest site we've ever attempted on Time Team. Nestling in the crook of land where the River Teviot joins the Tweed, it's a mile long and half a mile wide. Somewhere in here, we know, is a lattice of streets punctuated with civic buildings, churches, even a monastery. But where do we begin? And how on earth can we make sense of something as big as this in just three days? Mick, have we bitten off more than we can chew? No, I don't think so. I mean, whenever we come to a site, we have a, a, a series of choices about what we can do in the time available. And that's sort of governed by what we want to know about it, what, you know, what the particular problems that we pose. And we could spend 30 years or more here. But actually, what we're interested in really is about the layout of this. You know, what, where are the streets? Where were the town defences? Where were the churches and buildings within it? And we can get a great deal of that without digging a lot of holes, actually. You know, because we can do it from the other sources, the geophysics, looking at the early maps, and particularly this fantastic collection of, of air pictures Colin's got, which show all manner of features. Colin, there's an awful well, lot of activity around, well, isn't well, there? Well, there is. Fantastic. What are all these features? Well, here we've got a very obvious one, which is the, the ditch and bank feature, which we can see on the ground. And a section across that, I think, is going to tell us a great deal. What's all this stuff here? Well, all these little splodges appear to be occurring on, on church sites. And I'd suggested that they might actually be recumbent stone slabs giving <laughs> harsh marks. But Stuart suggests, uh, more prosaically, that uh, they may be molehills. <laughs> oh, Stuart! <laughs> You've no romance in you. No. <laughs> What's this here, Colin? This appears to be part of one of the street lines, and then the broad areas on either side of that would be where the house lines were. Yeah, so that has to be one of our main targets. I think it? so. If we can actually see something of what the buildings were like with all the pottery and stuff that they're using yeah. and the dates of that. Yeah. In other words, the ordinary sort of people that were living here. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. So we really need to geophys that area first, I think, John, to get a bit more detail before we start. That mark up there is that big ditch that runs up there. Stuart's already worked out roughly where the parch marks are on the ground, and soon we're on the trail of our first target, the remains of one of Roxburgh's main streets, which Emma appears to be trying to find with a couple of fluorescent light tubes. What does it do? This is a, a new uh, dual gradiometer system. John? Yeah. How come you've invested in this kind of stuff? Isn't the stuff that you used to use any good? Yes, it is. This is what you normally see us walking up and down the fields with. But what we've got here is a brand new instrument and it does things twice as quickly. And it actually looks a bit deeper into the ground as well if we need to. Because it's got this extra length to it. That's right. An integral part of the system is on the back here, though. That's just a counterbalance. This isn't just it, a joke. No, no, no. The weight of the water actually balances it. And, and what does this machine actually do? It's a magnetometer. So what is it reading for us? We're looking at magnetics, and so that will pick up rubbish pits, ditches, and it will give us, hopefully, a street plan. 
Historians believe Roxburgh started as a small, unremarkable town in the late 11th century. But its fortunes were transformed when one of Scotland's greatest rulers took a special interest in it. David I, who became king in 1124, is credited with bringing stability to Scotland after decades of internal strife. He chose Roxburgh as his power base. He built a castle here and gave the town a royal charter. It's basically his principal seat of government. He's witnessing, issuing most of his great charters here. He's holding councils here. There are major meetings of church councils taking place here. So if we're thinking of it in terms of what might have been, Roxburgh could have been Edinburgh. Yes, and there is nothing else quite like it in Scotland. The fact that we're sitting right on top of a medieval town is pretty <laughs> romantic, <laughs> yeah. but there must have been hundreds of towns built in the medieval period. Yeah, I mean, you're absolutely right. The, the, the 12th and 13th centuries was the great time of town foundation, town development. And in fact, most of the places that people think of as small market towns that they might live in or go and shop in were founded at that time. But of course, that's the difference, that they are still there, we still use them. Whereas here you can get a snapshot of Abs what life yeah. was like in the uh, 14th century. It hasn't been mucked up by all the, the, the post-medieval Tudor, Stuart, Victorian, all those buildings put on top. And we're really lucky to be able to delve into this apparently pristine site because the landowner, the Duke of Roxburgh, has refused all previous requests to dig here. It's a real coup. But it comes at a price. This is a scheduled ancient monument, and we're allowed to dig only 200 square metres of it, a tiny fraction of the overall area. So every trench must hit its target. And for that, we're relying on geophys to produce really crisp results. Why the long faces? Well, have a look at this, Tony. This is what John's just produced, and he's just describing it himself as trashed. And certainly it's not looking like the town plan that we were expecting to see, is it? Not at all. What I'm wondering is whether we've got ploughing. These sort of lines look like old plough lines. Right. right. We're right. expecting a street coming yeah. through at that sort yeah. of angle. And there's clearly nothing like that at the moment. So what do you reckon this grey thing is, John? Well, it could be the edge of the ploughing. It's just possible that is the edge of the archaeology. Is there a hint of something running across there like that? Yes. We really need to do more survey, Phil. You certainly need to come this way, don't yeah. you, if the street's down the middle? I thought when we got the first printout, we'd see the whole <laughs> town laid out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Didn't we all, yeah. But, I mean, all in all, a pretty disappointing start, and Mick's given John an hour to come up with better results. But we don't need newfangled gadgetry to provide all our targets. Good old-fashioned eyesight was all Phil needed to spot the worked stone brought up by the roots of this tree. It's growing out of an enormous earthwork bank, which runs along one side of the site. He thinks it's the town's defensive ramparts. We've got the bank running across here. Now, somewhere in here, there's probably going to be a wall. If you get a chance, have a look in the roots of that tree over there. There's about three or four courses of stone built into the root system. And then down here, mm -hmm. the trench will come down into the bottom of the ditch. With a bit of luck, we'll get some waterlogged deposits. Right, so we're going to go down so, and stop in the middle of the ditch. That's right. So trench one goes in here and its contents will be crucial to our chances of reconstructing the layout of ancient Roxburgh. Because not only are the town defences a key feature in themselves, they also mark the limit of its extent. So John, where do you want this hole then? 200 yards to the east of trench one, the extra hour of geophys seems to have paid off. We've expanded the survey now, and we have actually got this anomaly running through here, and I'm sure that's what's on the aerial photographs. So whether that's the road coming through, and we've got the ditch to the side. Ignore the lines going that way. I'm sure that's later ploughing, and this is all disturbance. The road, if it is a road, should come through on this alignment. Mm -hmm. So I think just a small five-metre trench at right angles across it. So Trench 2 goes in here, in a bid to locate a roadside ditch. Mm -hmm. 
I think the ditch should be where his bucket's going through now. Perhaps not quite the impressive target we'd all hoped for, but it's a start. OK, OK. Yeah, it's early days. Oh, absolutely. And now John's more confident about his geophys, he's in huge demand. Mick wants to see more of the area around Trench 2 in the hope a street plan will emerge. And Stuart wants him to have a look at our third target, another area of parch marks somewhere on the western edge of the site. Where should we be, Stuart? On... Well, in relation, you see this roadway that shows coming through here? That tree there is, is that one over there, so you need to be between that tree and the hedge line. All that area has got what look like archaeological features in it, whatever they are, if you so can resolve So basically we, we need to cover as much as we can yeah, again. Yeah, yeah. I thought you might say that. <laughs> right, uh, we've got to go right the way up to the fence. OK. I'm sorry. John and his squad are off again, looking for another road. Watch Mary, once she starts, that's it. Up till now, though, there's been a lot of looking on this site and not much finding. So it's a bit of a relief when Matt in Trench 1 finally hits some archaeology. We're clearing about this clay and um, this perfectly circular uh, feature just, have just appeared. And um, the edges of it are actually s still very much intact. The stuff inside it is really loose and you can see it's just going straight down. So, I mean, what we got? A post which is going to be what? Going to be about five or six inches across, yeah. Course, yeah. If you look at the stones, they come up here in the section, stop there, and this post hole's right in alignment with it. So it looks like what we might have is a timber structure, maybe padded up with this clay bank yeah. at the front to make a really firm, compact frontage to the bank with all this gravel yeah, flung in, in at the other side. OK, then, Fraser. This already looks convincing as a stout defensive rampart. The next step is to find and excavate the ditch that goes with it and fill soon on the money. Ah, now look, that's... Uh -huh. That's going into the ditch. Dan's also beginning to uncover a ditch in Trench 2. Though his is a more modest roadside ditch, he hopes it'll eventually lead us to a street with houses along it. Dan, is there anything at all? There is, there is. We do indeed have a ditch, and I've got an edge coming in here, and Bridget's got the other edge over there. OK, you've got a ditch, but is it a ditch for a road? Well, John's pretty adamant that it will, that it will be. Unfortunately, we'll have to extend the trench a little bit further in that direction to be absolutely sure about that. Are these finds from this trench, Derek? They're from the ditch, Phil. Good collection of 12th, 13th century medieval pottery. 12th and 13th is what yeah. we're after, isn't it? What's this? That's uh, from a straight-sided cooking pot, and that's why it's smoke blackened on the outside. Probably stood about that high. So are all these pieces of pot domestic? Basically, yes. But not necessarily from here. They could have been well, thrown from elsewhere. Yeah, but they're not very worn. I mean, I don't think they've travelled very far. Um, so that implies to me that they've come from a house nearby. I wouldn't normally get very excited about drab stuff like this, but right now, these cooking pots are just great. Evidence we're closing in on the street and the houses along it, which is just the boost we all needed. As the first day draws to a close, the team go into overdrive. In the trenches, the archaeologists are digging like men and women possessed. Stuart's tramping all over the countryside looking for more earthworks. And the geophysicists have got not one, but two new sets of results. The bad news is the area over there, nothing but ploughing, cutting into whatever's there. Yeah, very like what we had earlier, isn't it? But look at this. This is where Phil's trench is. Here's the defences. Look at the regular pattern yeah. we're starting to get inside. Yeah. I think this is really nice now. Yeah, that's much more like a town plan, isn't it? OK, if this really is good, what are we going to do with it tomorrow? Well, I think we should expand this trench, not only to, to get the, the rest of the road, mm. but to, to go alongside the road and see if there's, you know, the buildings that are producing this. And hopefully we'll get shed loads of this from the, the actual building alongside the road. Beginning of day two in our search for the ancient city of Roxburgh, somewhere underneath all this grass. And yesterday evening, John Gator said he'd got some good news and some bad news. The good news was that the geophys over there was looking really good. So we were going to extend the little trench that we'd got there into something really big. The bad news was that the geophys here was really indistinct. So, nine o'clock and what's happened? We've got no work going on there at all and we've got this really long 15 metre trench over over here. Shouldn't this trench be way over there? No, this trench is exactly where it ought to be, Tony. Remember I showed you the air photographs yesterday? 
how you've got these clear marks that look like a roadway. Yeah, yeah. And there are also features coming off it which might be either back boundaries to properties or buildings. But John, the geophys was really not good at all here, was it? Well, we'd got lots of problems with the ploughing that I talked about, but it's, it's really clear, look, it stops on this line, basically between the tree uh, and the gate over there. The ploughing comes up to there, but on this side, we're clear. And if I look at the geophysics now, I've got a bit more time, I can actually start to see the road features. So is it fair to say you've re-examined your evidence and found stuff you didn't find last night? Well, I suppose so. <laughs> <laughs> Matt, what have we got in the trench? Well, if we start at that end, you can see we've just clipped the edge of the road. That's where the compact gravel and sand is. Come in from there, this large dark area is where the ditch is, the roadside ditch. And then we're onto these stones here, these large flat stones, some kind of boundary to the road. And hopefully, as we go up here and clean up this end, we might find the uh, buildings and stuff coming off the road. Any finds, Derek? More medieval pottery, Tony. First piece of imported pottery, that's from Yorkshire. That's Yorkshire ware from England. Interesting enough, mostly this time from glazed jugs rather than cooking vessels. So what does that tell you? That suggests to me it's slightly later than the material we were looking at yesterday. Why are jugs later than plates? <laughs> because <laughs> cooking vessels become, they, they start making them out of iron later on. So what's all this starting to tell us? We've got this roadway and we identify a roadway over there where Trench 2 is. We'll have some idea of the layout between them and what sort of units people might have been living in. Fantastic! But the big news of the morning, and I mean huge, is what Phil's discovered in Trench 1. Am I right in thinking you're stood in the bottom of a huge defensive ditch? You're absolutely right. This is one edge coming right up here, and then it runs down into the bottom, and then climbs up to an enormous bank on that side. It is an awful lot deeper than the earthworks suggest. It must be, what, 10 feet at least? It's a very, very impressive ditch. If you're an attacker or anybody outside looking at somebody on the inside, they are very, very well defended. So do you know yet what's going on inside the ditch in terms of the defences? Ah, let me come up and I'll show you that. <laughs> now, you see, the ditch is going to be rising up here and then just beyond the edge of the ditch, which we think will be somewhere there, we've got this beautiful post hole in there. And funnily enough, we've got another one just back there. Now, this post here has actually been burnt. You can see the way the clay around it has been reddened by heat. Now, that it's beginning to look as though we've actually got some sort of timber framing within the, the, the front of the bank. And that would perhaps explain why this one's burnt and that one isn't, because it would have been in the middle of the rampart. So we can now put the first landmark of medieval Roxburgh back on the map. These huge defences ran along the one edge of the town not naturally protected by water. If attackers managed to negotiate the deep and difficult ditch, they were then faced with a stout wall, built from clay, supported on a timber frame and clad in stone. It would have been an impressive barrier. And as the evidence of burning suggests, it was absolutely not just for show. In fact, the city was besieged on numerous occasions. The most traumatic period in her history was between 1296 and 1318, when she found herself caught up in Edward I's wars against the Scots. Attacked and occupied by each side in turn, her inhabitants faced almost daily threat of invasion. So, so the one in 1313, when the Scots deliberately attack during the feast day, so the English will be taken unawares, and they seem to have been quite right. What happens is Sir James Douglas dresses his men up in black cloaks and gets them to go on hands and knees. It's nightfall, and the sentries on the walls think that they're looking at cattle straying. They break in, overwhelm the few of the garrison that were still armed. A few escape into the Great Tower, but they don't have supplies, they don't have weapons, and they give up after two days. All this begs the question, why was Roxburgh so desirable? Of course, its strategic position in the borders is part of the answer, as is its political importance as a royal borough. But the real reason is money. It's in one of the most ideal locations for the production of two of the most desirable commodities of the Middle Ages, wool and cattle hides. Now, they're being produced in bulk in this area. You've got some of the biggest corporate producers of the Middle Ages, and they're being traded probably through the, the great fair of St. James's that's held here end of July, beginning of August every year, where you have traders, merchants coming from all over Northern Europe dealing in the wool. And then it is traded down from Roxburgh 
out through Berwick, and Broxburgh really gets rich on this. The sale of Scottish hides and wool to Flanders was in fact so lucrative that Roxburgh became one of the wealthiest cities in Scotland, on a par with Edinburgh. Mix becoming increasingly confident that the layout of this medieval money-making machine is within our grasp. He thinks the street plan emerging from the Geophys results is actually the very heart of the town, and this is where he wants everyone to focus. He's asked John to survey yet more of the area. He's sanctioned a massive extension to Trench 2, which, he hopes, will expose a large chunk of street and some of the houses along it. And he's dispatched Carenza to search the medieval documents for references to the people who lived there. But dark forces are at work in the shape of Stuart Ainsworth. Just keep going along this, this track for a while, then. Isn't this taking us away from everything? He appears to have kidnapped John and forced him to drive to the other end of the site, about half a mile away, to tempt him with a completely new target. You can see how it dips off here towards the fence, yeah. and then beyond it's a patch of nettles. It's sort of all in this, this area here. Oh, not, not where all the nettles are. <laughs> Indeed so. <laughs> You're joking. And Stuart thinks they're covering something much more exciting than mere streets and houses. He thinks this isolated spot could be the site of St James's Church, one of the most important and substantial buildings in medieval Roxburgh. Its rough position is marked on 17th century maps, but its precise location has long been a mystery. We don't know whether it's those earthworks. It might be further around there, it might be further around there. We don't know it specifically on those earthworks. You don't like well, the no, no. metals, do you? <laughs> no, it, it's just the fact we're just starting to get a good plan, we think, of the town. Yeah. And if we stop halfway through and come over here, I, I'd prefer to argue the case with Mick. I think if we go beyond the fence... In the end, Stuart reluctantly selects a small patch of the earthwork for John to geophys, and for the time being, everyone's happy again. Well, relatively. Oblivious to all the strategic wrangles going on around them, Kerry and Matt have been quietly scraping away in Trench 3. Well, we found what we're looking for. It looks like we've got a building at this end, so you would actually be standing inside the house. So, we've got the beginnings of the town, Beginnings of the we? town, yeah. How do you know this is a building and not just a load of old rubble? Well, the stones are fairly misshapen, but if you look down underneath your feet down here, you do actually have small pieces of mortar, which would have bonded these stones together. And if we move along this way, the edge of the house here, we've got this rather nice little gullyway here. Just here? Yeah, that could have been used to kind of sluice out anything from the, from the house cleared up. Better still, the house is full of very striking pottery. A face mask jug. That's lovely, isn't it? What would it have looked like? I think probably more than one face mask, maybe two or three. Um, handle, spout on one side. Our first real evidence of international trade um, is this pottery, which is French. Um, that's, again, from very high-quality glazed water or, or wine jugs. These pots would have been expensive. And as Matt digs down, the size and construction of the building confirm it was once home to some of Roxburgh's wealthier citizens. Along this side here, we have this wall, possibly yes. an internal wall, and you can see it's these stones bonded with this lovely yellow mortar there. Oh, right, yes. And this is clearly the wall that we, we picked up in, in the air photograph. Yeah. Would that be the other side of it there? Then, well, the I, other I think pagan? it could well be, and perhaps we've got a row of them. Yeah, so that would make this house about, uh, what, 20 feet wide? In just a few hours, Matt's put our second key feature firmly on the map. A road that no one ever knew existed, which was lined with large, high-status, stone-built houses. It's like a posh suburb, inhabited, perhaps, by people who'd made good in the wool trade. Phil, though, is after more ordinary folk. And in a now massively extended trench, too, he thinks he's getting very close to them. Hello. Hello. 
How are you getting on here? Oh, pretty well. Do you want to come and have a look? Well, here we got this road. We think it's probably running sort of more or less north-south, really. Oh, right. Then, as we come this way, we come over this bitty, hefty uh, roadside ditch. Now, as we come on again, we've got a much narrower ditch. We think that might be a fence. We've even got features in here that are going perpendicular to the main road. So we might actually have buildings fronting onto the street. Right, and that road is running north-south. That's right. Well, in that case, it must be Market Street. How did you know that? Well, we know there are two main streets in Roxburgh. One of them runs east-west, that's King Street, and the other one runs north-south, and that's Market Street. And I suppose you're now going to tell me you know exactly who lived here and what their addresses were. <laughs> well, actually, I can give you some of those. I don't need joking. <laughs> no, seriously, I mean, possibly, with a bit more research, we could try and work out whose tenement this is. Well, then, we are beginning to get the archaeology associated with these people because, look at this one. I mean, we've got a big stone there. And another one there. We reckon this might be a well or something. A well. Like now then, if we can get some finds out of that, we can perhaps tell you what sort of lifestyle your inhabitants were living. You do, you do your job and I'll do mine, all right? Right, brilliant. <laughs> Which for Phil means extending trench two yet again to reveal more of the house. I hope someone's keeping an eye on the square meterage because we can't be too far off our limit. Karenza's job's a bit less physical, but that doesn't make it any easier. Why have you drawn all these people's names on little tatty bits of paper? <laughs> well, what I'm trying to do is get my head round this sort of thing. Margaret, the wife of Roger, had a chantry. William Bosville adjoined on the north side. A tenement belonging to the abbot of Melrose lay on the south side of that which belonged to the wife of the pious Roger. No one's attempted this before, and I can see why. It's a brain ache. We'll put him here. Right? right. A tenement belonging to the abbot of Melrose lay on the south side of Roger. Abbot of Melrose is. So make the most of it. There's the river. John evidently won his battle with the nettles on Stuart's mystery earthwork. But the things you're probably interested in the high resistance here. And there's a certain regularity to it. When you say high resistance, that means it might be stone below the ground there? Yeah, it could be stone, it could be rubble. Well, it's... rubble would be good because we know from the documentary sources that the church was robbed and greystones were taken away and so on. And what you might expect to see is rubble thrown back in, into the places they've been digging. So that potentially could be very exciting, couldn't it? As St James's Church is our best bet for a really solid bit of architecture, we all think it's worth a trench, which Mick decides to put in here. And bingo, just inches under the surface is a mass of stonework. You've got the big dress block turning up there. Hey, you this is great, isn't it? Which Bridget appears to be excavating single handed. This is what I love about male archaeologists. What? They come into the trench to help, and then they just stand there with a shovel and just watch the machine. <laughs> Eventually, the blokes get the point, and everyone's soon scraping at the stonework. Yeah, sort of architectural stone you might expect from it's, a church, isn't yeah. it? It's everywhere. The individual pieces are huge and look as if they're either floor slabs or gravestones. And amidst these megaliths, Kerry's uncovered the find of the day. It looks as though it just dropped out of the sky and landed there. Oh, that's fantastic. Can we come in? Yeah, come on in. What do you think it is? Well, the shape of it, it's uh, wedge-shaped. It could be a, a voussoir from an archway or something of that kind. Remind me what a voussoir is. It's one of these segmental blocks that fits into a, an arch. Looking at it, though, you've got this stepped base that could be the base of the cross. What, here? Here, yeah. yeah. So it could actually be the cross as the tree on which uh, Christ crucified. Do you still get a thrill after all these years when you find something as beautiful as that? Every time I find something like this, and especially this, is absolutely brilliant. End of day two, and what a cracker it's been. Every trench has produced fantastic archaeology, and we can now add the main road through town, Market Street and St James's Church to our plan. We're not celebrating yet, though, because there are swathes of this site still to explore and loads of new targets, including an area the archaeologists are calling the Old Borough, where the founding fathers built the city's very first houses. What would be your hunch as to where we should be looking? Uh, 
What's that bang in the middle of that field? Can you see that earthwork there alongside the river? What did this long strip of a field here? Yeah, so I think that is part of the defences you might put round the edge of a, of a small town next to the castle. But actually, just as we're flying round it, it is very narrow, and it might even be too narrow. They might have had to come out onto K Bray. It would have to be on the top of there. Have you changed your mind already? Just someone fly round. <laughs> just to make sure, we circle the site once more, and Stuart spots a third possible location. I like the area between where St James's Church is that we've located and the castle over there. You face your mind again! <laughs> it's not easy, is it? <laughs> no, it isn't. Ideally, we'd like to dig a hole in all three of Stuart's sites, but we've only got time to geophys one. So mix plumped for K Bray, an area of high ground between the castle and the main site. And with every passing minute, the pressure's building. Henry, just come here a second, will you? All right, Tony. Last night, you told me that we were allowed to dig 50 square metres, so we could possibly have squeezed two trenches out of that. Yeah. Is it 50 square metres? Th things have changed. I've, re I've reassessed it. We're actually down to 20. 20 square metres, yes. that's all we've got left. That's it. And we've got three sites, and we've got to make a decision within the hour. Thanks, mate. OK. <laughs> One bombshell at the start of day three is bad enough, but Stuart's just dropped another. He thinks the stonework in Trench 4, while clearly ecclesiastical, isn't part of the church building itself. Of course, we've got to find out what it is part of, but in the meantime, Stuart's identified another earthwork, about 20 metres away, which he thinks is a much stronger contender. That's yeah. the feature that's found in the trench. If you do a, a sketch of these earthworks here, you've got this lovely, regular east-west platform. We've got a big bank out here which seems to define an enclosure, which might be a churchyard or something. And at first pass, I would have thought this would be a good candidate for the primary church building. It's now 11 o'clock, our hour's up, and if we don't dig our final trench now, then we never will. Oh, and Henry's just told me he's recalculated yet again, and it isn't 20 square metres that we're still allowed to dig, it's 17 and a half. Mm. Now, Mick, <laughs> the archaeologists have given me four different potential yeah. locations for this final trench. You've probably got half a dozen other ideas. We've got to make a decision, haven't we? We have, yeah. Yeah, and we've just been discussing that. I think we're duty-bound to put one in up on K Bray up here. Why do you say duty-bound? Well, because it was in the research design to see whether there was the early burrowers up here. But you don't even think that the old burrow's up here, do you? I, I From think the sky, you said it was somewhere right. else. I think it's one of three possibilities. It's K Bray, there's the area between the mm. church and the castle, and there's the area immediately below the castle. So I don't think, you know, that we, we know where to put this trench, quite frankly. But, I mean, <laughs> we've got some of our best results from up here. I mean, look at this. This is the magnetics, and it looks as though we've got buildings, and for buildings to show in magnetics it is rare. I mean, it what, could that, be that they're that burned mean? down. Oh, they're burned. Oh, right. Could be. And I'd like to put a trench in just on there Well, to I think test. we'd use some of our currency up to do that, certainly. Some of it? How much? Well, I don't know, four by three, you know, three by five, something like that. Well, that's yeah. it, really, isn't well, it? Well, no, no, hang on a minute. If you're going to do five by three, that leaves a couple of... Square meters. Oh, God, <laughs> Stuart, that's taking us right up to the but wire. I've got that quite fond of the church <laughs> down there. I think it'd be really nice to resolve what that platform is next to the ecclesiastical stuff we've got in the trench. You don't like using the maximum allowable area, no, do you? It doesn't no. seem very good practice. But I do like it? test pits. <laughs> <laughs> good man. Yeah. That sounds like a decision. Trench 5 goes in on top of K Bray in search of the old borough. This way a little bit, Fraser. Brilliant. And Stu now has to decide where in his platform to dig a one-metre test pit that'll solve the mystery of St James's Church. And what a mystery it's turning out to be. The voussoir, which yesterday we thought was part of the inside of the church, has today been identified as something completely different, a grave slab from the cemetery, which is lovely, but doesn't help us locate the building. And the rest of the stonework? Still not a clue. Time to call in an expert. Um, um, uh, um, hmm. 
some hum. <laughs> it does seem very, very strange indeed, though. Well, at the moment, I would have thought you've got something extremely interesting, but extraordinarily <laughs> puzzling. <laughs> Thank you. That's, yeah, that's, that's yes, exactly yes, what we thought. That's my <laughs> special opinion. Yeah. Mm. Right up to the peg, eh? Amid the hurly-burly, there's one oasis of quiet. To get everyone in the right frame of mind, we've organised a medieval market of our own. It's going to open for business at the end of the day, and these good traders are busy preparing to part the archaeologists from their hard-earned cash. They'll be selling everyday medieval essentials, food, leather goods like shoes and pouches, wooden artefacts, wool and clothing, and arrows. For nearly 400 years, people like this would have lived, worked and traded up and down Market Street, the road in Phil's Trench. He's hunting for the remains of their houses and workshops, and he's doing very well. If you remember here, we had this, this linear arrangement running perpendicular to our front trench, yep. which we thought actually might be a property boundary. Well. Now, Lucy, here, you see where the photographic stick is? Yes, yeah. We've now got this, what we think is the back of a building, running parallel to the ditch and to that tenement building. So this is one big building, as it were, going like that, That's back right. like, and across like that. Starting from over here, probably coming round along here, and then returning back along here. Phil's tenement would have looked like this. A fairly basic structure made mainly out of wood. It was a bit like a modern terrace divided into several properties. Similar tenements would have stretched out along both sides of the road. So okay. what have you got to beat that? Well, <laughs> I don't have got anything to beat it, but um, the document we have here records three properties which have In been fact, Carenza's played a blinder. Drawing on the Geophys results, she's worked out that Phil's Trench is right next to the junction of Market Street and the main east-west road, King Street. And using information from the document, she's established the names of some of the people who might actually have lived in Phil's building. We're on the, the west on the side of Market right. Street, if that's north. So I suspect this building that you found is either William Boswell's building, um, William Skinner's or the Abbot and Melrose's. Do we know whether any of them were craftsmen? Because within the finds of this stone line pit, we had a hint of, of some of the craftsmanship in this street. Uh, Derek looked at that earlier on, and he's pretty sure that is a piece of kiln furniture from a pottery kiln. Do you have any, any idea what date that might be? Well, it would have to be 13th or 14th century. Well, the document we have here is round about 1330. So perhaps that's the house and perhaps this kiln was a little bit later than that after the house had gone out of use. Either way, Phil and Carenza have managed to produce a snapshot of the heart of 14th century Roxburgh. This is how it might have looked on market day. A buzz of activity as William the Skinner, Hutred the Baker and other residents of Market Street plied their trade. Perth still exists, Edinburgh still exists, Berwick still exists. Why, of all the great Scottish medieval towns, is this one the only one that's under the ground? Well, I think it had bad luck. I mean, it, it, it was in a very, very uh, vulnerable area in the toings and froings between Scotland and England. Because it's so far south? Yes, and, and, and no one had really decided whether this was a bit of Scotland or whether this was a bit of England. Probably the decisive moment comes when Berwick falls into English hands again and remains in English hands. The king is not going to allow Scottish merchants to be trading through an English port. Because he won't get the tax. Precisely, the revenue goes to the English port instead. And that happens when? That's 1482. With Berwick in English hands, Roxburgh had no gateway to the markets of Europe and no money coming in. The inhabitants gradually drifted away to other cities like Edinburgh and Perth in search of a living. And by the early 1600s, Roxburgh had ceased to exist.
Two and a half hours ago, we said we'd put a test pit in over there, and as you can see, absolutely nothing's been done about it. Over here, we said we'd put in a 3x5, and they've only put in a 3x2. And here, the archaeologists are now saying they want to extend this trench, although I thought we'd already agreed that we'd gone up to the limit of what we could dig. Mick, Dad. every single decision that has been made seems to have been overturned. Um, yeah, you could look at it like that. <laughs> Why? <laughs> well, um, here, we don't think we can resolve this now without an extension on each end, really. Not what do you mean much. we can't resolve this? Well, because we've got a big mass of stonework, which we think might be a wall of the church, and we need to see if it's got doorways on it. And we'll what will the door tell us? If it's got doorways, then we'll know that's the north wall, and these stones and slabs in here are inside the church there, and that will help a lot to understand it. But that doesn't explain why they haven't started that test bit over no, there. No, well, there we're waiting for the geophys results, because we, if we thought we could see some, you know, church-like arrangement underneath, and we might not even need to do that. Mm -hmm. Hang on a minute, hang on. Here you are. Oh, Sorry. he's here, he's here, <laughs> right. Look, that's where the trench has gone in. We've extended the survey now over Stuart's earthworks. Yeah. And we're getting indication of lots more masonry. Right. But no clear wall lines. I can't give you a plan of a church. No. Presumably, given that geophys, you still want to dig a test pit? Of course I do. Mick, we're not going to be able to hit all three targets, are we? Well, we might be able to if they don't need the extra square meterage up mm -hmm. there. Yeah. Mick to Dan. What size area have you got open at the moment up there, Dan? It's a three by two, Mick. It's six metres squared. What have you got in it? Have you got any data or material yet? No, we've got the stone wall that the geophysics predicted, but uh, unfortunately... Nothing not today, then. So, do you think you need a bigger area to resolve that? I don't think a bigger area to resolve anything, Mick. There's not really anything here to resolve. <laughs> OK, that's actually the right answer, I'll have to <laughs> encouraging. <laughs> it certainly isn't. This wall might still be part of the old borough, but the lack of time and resources mean we've simply got to let it go. Instead, we're going to use up our remaining trench space to untangle the complexities of St James's Church, which, with just a couple of hours left, is going to be a real scramble. First up, Stuart's test pit. It's all your fault if it goes wrong, sprayed it in the wrong place. Yeah, we're hitting stonework. We'll get, get, um, get bridge trowel. Ian cleans it up a bit so John and Stuart can make an assessment. I think we've got another one of those things over there. You what, grave slab? Yeah, you see the way it's bevelling. Is it part of the church? Is that on That's, the same it's alignment? It's on the same alignment as that one yeah. over there. But yeah. it, the line of the no, wall? No, it's not. Yeah. It's going that way. It's east-west, though. It's the same orientation as those. Oh, yes, but that's like that and that's like that. To resolve the issue, Mick sanctions a rapid one-metre extension to the pit, which yields instant results. So, Ian, what have you got there? Well, take a look. What do you think? Right, well, it looks like two skulls to me. These skulls are the end of Stuart's earthwork theory. They're not covered by grave slabs, so can't have been buried inside the church. The test pit is in the cemetery. Which means everything now depends on the extension to Trench 4. They hope it'll prove their theory that this is a doorway in this, the north wall. I'll have to do. But it's quickly apparent their theory's wrong. And it's exactly the same as the other end. It's not a door. And this is not a wall. It's actually part of a much larger detached platform. But all is by no means lost, because Richard now recognises it as something much more magnificent than a mere wall. It's looking increasingly like it could be the bottom of one of these big monumental type tombs. We don't really have anything like that. No, we don't. I mean, that would be unique for Scotland. I mean, there may have been things like that around, but, I mean, they're long gone. Yeah. Um, if Richard's that's... right then this is a remarkable discovery. Monumental, expensive, elaborate, altogether much grander than the graves in the cemetery. 
It was the final resting place of a wealthy individual, quite possibly one of the great political leaders of Roxburgh. And it means we've managed somehow to snatch victory from the jaws of defeat. Because tombs like this were built inside churches. So our picture of medieval Roxburgh is complete. Where once there was a blank on the map, we can now insert at least the bones of a city. This is Market Street, and it ran from Greyfriars in the south, past Cay Bray, to St James's Church in the north. It was intersected by the other main thoroughfare, King Street. This junction was the heart of the city, and the whole area would have been packed with houses, shops and workshops. At the peak of the city's fortunes, these would have stretched to the defences in the east and to the river in the west. Along here, probably connecting King Street to the castle, ran Matt's nameless road, which we think was lined with the homes of Roxburgh's wealthiest inhabitants. The digging may be done, but there's still some unfinished business. The medieval traders are tempting us all with their fare. An appropriate way to end our exploration of one of the great commercial centres of medieval Europe. When I first drove down this field three days ago, all I could see were a few green bumps and some silly sheep. But now I know that if history had taken just a slightly different course, I'd now be driving down a street as grand as Edinburgh's Royal Mile. <laughs>